Five I'll minutes or so it. looking at a cathode ray tube and how it works. And you've got to know the different parts of this for your leaving circuit. Okay? Yeah. Uh, there's two, we apply a voltage at two different parts of it for two different reasons. The first thing we want to do is we want to heat up a small piece of metal here in order to excite the electrons so the electrons do profit. The bottom is at about six volts. So I just hooked those six volts from there back into the back here. Okay, and what's now happening as soon as I turn it on is, in fact, if we can turn the lights off. So you can't see exactly where the light filament is, but you can see the, the orange glow inside there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a little filament inside there that's lighting up. Okay, so we need that for a reason. So if we turn the lights back on just for now. So I just wanted you to make sure that you can see the filament lighting up. So there's six volts being applied to that. As a result of that heating up, there are electrons flying off. What is that process by which electrons are fired off the top of a hot metal? Thermionic emission. So there's electrons going off in all different electron, in directions. I want to attract those electrons all the way over here. This happened over 100 years ago, and it was one of the seminal experiments which verified that electrons actually existed. And it was a guy called J.J. Thompson was one of the first guys to carry out this experiment and realize its significance. The, they, they had been predicted in advance, even by a guy called, Irish fellow called Stoney, but nobody was ever actually able to verify that these things existed. So they had this set up. In fact, they call this a cathode ray tube because you've got a cathode and an anode. So to get the cathode and an anode, you need a positive and a negative end. So two more leads. Let me turn this off while I'm making changes. Red to here. Red is positive. So red, I want this end to be positive. Right, so I'm making a positive end of my power supply. That's the best way of doing this, so you can all see over here somewhere. So that's going to be my positive. Is that the anode or the cathode? Anode. Anode. So I'm, I've got to make this end a bit negative. So black is the negative end. So I double up my blacks there, and I put it back down in here. So basically, I've got two circuits: one for my filament to heat it up at six volts. The other is going to be a couple of thousand volts between here and here. Okay. And when I turn this guy on. Uh, let me turn the voltage down to the bottom to begin with. So at this stage, there are my voltage is pretty low. I turn it up to about 0.26 the kilovolts, which is 250 volts. So we're not seeing anything. So electrons are being accelerated in all directions, but not enough of them are being accelerated all the way over here to be seen on the screen. In fact, some of them might even be excited and are getting accelerated beyond the anode, and they're coming back again. What we want to do is accelerate them with such momentum that they keep going to the end. So what I've got to do is turn up the voltage. So for that to happen, I need the lights off again, please, Jennifer. This time we're keeping an eye on my white screen. And as I increase the voltage, eventually, you should get to the stage where you see your green dot. Yeah. So that there is a stream of electrons hitting it per second, hitting it, you know, hitting it per unit time. Now, this, before people realized what was going on, they realized you had a cathode, and it looked like something was coming from the cathode, so they called them cathode rays. It took J.J. Thompson to realize that these cathode rays were actually rays made up of individual electrons. So we know that electron has got a small mass. We know that it's got a very small, well, I want to say a very small area. We know it's got a very small mass. We know that it's got a charge. So we know that it's got a, we know that it is a particle. What is really strange about this, and this isn't on the syllabus, is that when you go into the realm of quantum physics, the whole notion of whether something is a particle or a wave becomes very, very iffy. And what happens here is particularly surprising. If I increase the voltage, you've pretty much got to be on this side to see what you're getting. Or you might see it on the back side. But as I increase my voltage up and up and up, what are we getting on the screen? <coughs> a series of, <coughs> which seems to be reflect, indicate, it's a interference and waves, and that's exactly what's going on here. Now, the boys didn't realize this at the time. It took 20 years. In fact, J.J. Thompson won a Nobel Prize for proving. They say he discovered the particle, insofar as this can be a discovery. He discovered the electron as a particle. About 20 years later, his son actually came along and did a variation of this experiment. And he said, way, something strange is going on here. This only happens if something is a wave. So what he had was some sort of a diffraction grating inside in the middle of the cathode ray tube, and even a piece of crystal acts as a diffraction grating. He put that in his diffraction in his cathode ray tube, and he got a diffraction pattern, proving that the electrons are actually waves, because you can only get an interference pattern like this from a wave-like source. As I said, that's off the syllabus. It should be on it because it's incredibly significant, and that's where the whole conflict and the wave-particle duality kicks in. And it, obviously, it doesn't make sense. How can something be a particle and a wave? So we're going to roll back a little bit from that. I'm going to go back just to my dots. 
reduce the voltage until we just get the dot. And this time, in fact, we can turn the lights on again, Jennifer. This would have been one of the um, tests they did because they want to find out what exactly is coming from the cathode to the anode. So one of the things they did was they brought up a magnetic field. And lo and behold, it gets, it's affected by it. Okay, so again, this is pretty significant. We now know that because it's cathode rays are actually electrons, if you've got a flow of electrons, you actually have what? Charge. An electric charge or electric current. If the electrons are going that way, what way is the current going? The opposite way. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try and see does Lenz's left hand, or whose rule? The FBI rule. What rule is that? No, it's not Lenz's law. Is it, is it called something or is it just called the FBI? The left hand rule. Something left -hand. Yeah. It's Fleming's left hand rule. Thank you very much. Fleming's left hand rule. So according to this, my current is going in that direction. So FBI, so I must get my current going that way. Okay, I want to find out what direction my force will be in. So this says my force will be down if my magnetic field is in that direction. So my current is that way. If I can get my magnetic field that way, and to get my magnetic field that way, magnetic field lines go from where to where? North, north to south. south. North to south. So I've got the north end of a magnet here. There's a little uh, dimple on it. That's the north end of a magnet. So if I bring my north end of a magnet there, it means lines go from north to south in that general direction. So magnetic line is going in that direction, my current is going back that direction, back towards the table. So if I've got this done right, my electron should go in that direction. Down. Let me bring it in, and down it goes. So again, it's indicating that it is some part of a flow of charge that you've got here. 